I don't think that God gets tired. I mean, admittedly, I don't know that for sure. Um, like, there's no Bible verse. It's like, oh, God doesn't get tired. Like, that's not in there. And that's not really a classic question. Like, I don't know, like, of any religion or any religious group or any, like, guru or, you know, priest or rabbi or whatever that sat around and, and had a conversation about whether or not God gets tired. But, like, I just feel like there's some things in creation that get tired, like us, and there's some things in, in creation that don't get tired, like trees and mountains and streams and things like that. And so I just figure, like, well, if God's the one who makes all the stuff, then it just stands to reason that he's not getting tired. Like he's in the group that doesn't get tired. Like God never comes down the stairs in like a bathrobe and like the kids come up and they've got questions and he's just like, not yet. I need to get my coffee. Because if nothing else, God would choose Red Bull at eight in the morning instead of the coffee, which is clearly the superior choice for caffeine intake. I mean, like, that's not God. God doesn't do that. So God doesn't get tired. I just feel, again, I can't prove it, but I just feel strongly, and I'm just going to ask you guys to go with me, that God does not get tired, right? So with that being said, God doesn't get tired. Here's Genesis chapter 2, like, very first story of the Bible. This is what we read about God. It says, so the, creations of, the creation of the heavens and the earth and everything in them was completed. On the seventh day, God had finished his work of creation so he rested from all his work. And God blessed the seventh day and declared it holy because it was the day when he rested from all of his work of creation. So, bit of a conundrum. If God doesn't get tired, what is he resting for? What does that mean? And this doesn't seem to be a, a minor question. Like, maybe we should have talked about this as, you know, priests, rabbis, philosophers, yogis, whatever. Like, because as we talk about, you know, the nature of God, this resting thing is connected not only to his creation of all things, right? Like, the, the very first story in the Bible is, you know, here's six days where God makes a bunch of stuff, and that's creation. And then the seventh day, God rests. Uh you know, it's it's part and parcel to that story as we understand the nature of God. Um, but also, it's in at least in the Hebrew scriptures, which is where Genesis is, uh, it says that that seventh day is now holy, meaning it's set apart, meaning it's important, meaning it's something that we should be considering, meaning it's something we're supposed to remember, meaning it's something that's supposed to be important to us, right? And the seventh day being a day that God rests is a day that's is something that's supposed to be important to us. It's a holy situation. And of course, the Jews, uh, you know, forever had this Sabbath concept. Um, you know, the on the seventh day of the week, they had, you know, the, that whole part of their law. But it goes back to their understanding of the nature of God, that God rested. So the question is, if God does not get tired, what does it mean that he rested? And I think the answer, at least the working definition we're going to go with this morning, is this. You see, it's very easy to worship God and to praise God for the good things God has done, like making the heavens and the earth and making light and making people and making animals and all of that. It is very easy to praise God for that stuff. It is very easy to praise God for what God does. And in the first six days of creation, we see a whole lot of reasons why we should praise God. By God resting, what we mean is God is no longer doing stuff that God does. God chooses not to be productive. God chooses not to be creative. God chooses to not do any of the stuff that, you know, makes him God. And we are supposed to understand that God is every bit as worthy of worship on day seven as he was days one through six. By God resting, we see that his nature, who he is as a being, is in fact what makes God, God, and what makes God worthy of not only our worship, but also our trust, and also our belief, and also our faith, and also, 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 also. It's not that we're supposed to praise God for what he does only, or even primarily. God is worthy of worship apart from anything he does, and the Sabbath, the seventh day of resting, shows us that God is still God even when he's doing nothing, which is why he rests. And when we see that, will we understand why the Sabbath is such a cool concept? We understand why God gave that to us as just an incredible gift. 
You see, if the seventh day, this Sabbath, this rest of God, by the way, God doesn't get tired. If God is choosing to not be productive, God is choosing to not be creative. And in that choosing, he is showing that he is worthy in and of himself. And he says, this is a holy day for you. Then the message of God's rest, the message of the Sabbath, the message of this holiness is that you and I are not defined by our productivity. We are not defined by our jobs. We are not defined by our creativity. We are not defined by what we can do. We're not defined by what we can accumulate. We're not defined by what we can collect. We're not defined by what we can earn. Sure, those things are great. Like, you should have a job and be productive and do all the stuff you can do. Great. God, God gave us these gifts to do stuff, but that's not what makes you you, and that's not what makes you valuable. Just as God is worthy of worship— Simply by being God. Those made in the image of God are valuable and important and worthy of love. Not because they're productive, not because they do stuff, but because they exist. <laughs> Which is a fancy way of saying you are valuable, you are loved, you are important, no matter what you do. No matter how productive you are, no matter how creative you are, no matter whether you're struggling or not struggling, you're not more lovable or more important because you do good things. You're not less lovable or less important because you do bad things or don't do things at all. Because we have our value intrinsically and inherently. That's the way this works. The Sabbath teaches us the value and the worth of every single person, yourself included, not for anything we've done, not for anything we do, but simply because we have been made by a God who is himself valuable apart from anything he does. And I think that's pretty great. <laughs> that's worth remembering once a week. That's worth remembering like three or four times a week. And by the way, that's worth talking about not just like in the future time, but like now. I'm not talking about something like one day I'm going to die and go to heaven and then have this realization. I'm talking that God said, this is something that I want you to know now. This is a peace. This is an understanding. This is a comfort. I want you right now, people sitting in this room at this second, I want you to know that you are valuable and important and worth loving no matter how productive you are or are not. That is a gift we are given right now. It's not about heaven. It's not about an afterlife. It's about this life now. And that's great. And that's amazing. And that's wonderful. And that's something that is so easy to miss. It's just so easy to miss. So one day, God's people, of, of the people of Israel, found themselves free. The first time in centuries. For like 400 years or so, uh, the people of Israel had been slaves in Egypt. Which means their entire lives had revolved around their productivity. Their entire lives had revolved around what they could and could not accomplish. Right? If they were able to build, if they were able to you know, make bricks, if they were able to, to toil in the hot sun all day, then they had value, then they had a home, then they had food, then they were treated you know, at least somewhat well despite being property. If they could not do those things, they had no value, they had no worth, and really, they were better off dead. For over 400 years, that's the way it was the people of Israel. Which, from a certain vantage point, is basically the worst thing ever. But from the vantage point of the people of Israel, at least they understood where they stood. <laughs> you know, at least they knew what it was. They knew waking up, if, if I can do you know, the stuff I'm supposed to do, then I have value, I have worth, uh, and I, I have earned my keep. And if I don't, well, then I guess you know, I'm probably not going to live very long. But God didn't want that. That, of course, was awful. They didn't like it uh, for obvious reasons, um, understatement of the sermon. And so they cried to God, and then Moses shows up, and it's to let my people go, that whole thing. And then, you know, there's a burning bush in there, and there's plagues, and there's the Red Sea, and all that stuff. And after all that, and you probably heard that story, uh, the people of Israel are free. But a funny thing happened with their freedom. The first time, they didn't have anybody telling them what to do. And for the first time, they didn't have an ability to define themselves by anything at all. 
again, before, they were productive. You make enough bricks, you build enough buildings, you toil in the hot sun long enough, you have value worth, you get food, you get shelter. In the wilderness, that's not the way it is. There is no concept of be productive and therefore you have value. That's not how it works. So the people of Israel started to freak out. They started to be scared, and, 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 and please understand, it, it wasn't so much, un, I mean, it's unfaithfulness, but the unfaithfulness came from their fear, right? They started complaining. They said, look, I, we don't even know where our next meal's coming from, uh, God or Moses or whoever. Like, we, we have no idea what's happening. You know, man, let's just go back to Egypt. <laughs> like, they're, you know, they're on this way to this promised land that's supposed to be amazing, and they said, you know, we, we, just, we, just, we just want to have a, a, a square meal and, you know, three meals a day, and we just want to have shelter, and, like, we'll just do whatever. Like, just go back and be slaves. You know, it was, at least we knew where we stood then. Now we're just kind of adrift out here. And God says, look, I want you to trust me. I want you to believe in me, and, and I will give you what you need, okay? I'm going to give you food every single day. It's going to be called manna. It's going to come from heaven. You literally will never have to worry about food. All you're going to need to do is, is, you know, pick the food up off the ground and eat the food that day. That's all you got to do. Like, it's, it's just that simple. And people are like, okay, well, that seems like a thing we can trust. That seems like a situation we can handle. Okay, good, fine, all right, for a little bit. And then they're like, well, here's the deal. Now all we're eating is manna. And like, I get, so like my favorite, I recently did this like 64 um, fast food foods bracket, like March Madness style. And I recently did this, by the way, if you haven't done like brackets, like ranking stuff, it's the most fun thing ever. You should do that, right? So I did this with the fast food. The final two came down to um, Popeye's chicken sandwich, okay? And uh, Little Caesar's crazy bread. Little Caesar's Crazy Bread won because it's the best thing ever. I, when I think of manna from heaven, I think of Little Caesar's Crazy Bread. Just my favorite thing in the world. But I'll be honest, I don't think I could eat that every day. Like, I think, I mean, I guess I could, but like, I feel like I would complain a little bit. So I'm actually going to give the, the, the Israelites a little bit of a pass. Because even if manna is the best thing they've ever eaten, it's the same thing every day. Like... It's Little Caesar's Crazy Bread every day. That's just, that's just too much. So they started complaining again. They said, okay, we know that God has given us this, but like this life is supposed to be better. The promised land is supposed to be better. Traveling, you know, following God is supposed to be better than Egypt. When we were in Egypt, we got meat, we got fish, we got bread, we got vegetables. Like we had all sorts of food. We just want to go back to Egypt. <laughs> and again, guys, it was fear, you know? For hundreds of years, people lived and died. For 400 years, people, you know, generations of Jewish people had lived and died and lived and died, always knowing the score. This is the score. We exist as, as property. We exist essentially as livestock. If we are productive, we have value. And God wanted them to understand they had value apart from their productivity. They had value apart from anything they could do or say or you know, produce or create. They were not their jobs. They were not their labor. And they never got it. They never got it. So they don't get end up in the promised land. At least that first generation doesn't. And in the New Testament, there's this book called Hebrews. And in the book of Hebrews, the writer is, is talking about this, this idea, this, this whole thing with the, the Jews and, and the Exodus and the wilderness and God's rest that he, is, he wants for us, the Sabbath, this, this understanding of our worth. And he essentially says, look, the Jews, they didn't get it. Like that generation doesn't get it. And as the writer of the book of Hebrews transitions from that, using that as an illustration to where we are, he says something really alarming. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's almost, it's frightening. It's, it's supposed to be frightening. This is, this is what we read in the book of Hebrews, chapter 4. He says this, that God's promise of entering his rest still stands. So we ought to tremble with fear that some of you might fail to experience it. For this good news that God has prepared this rest has been announced to us just as it was to them, meaning those Jewish people in the Exodus. But it did them no good because they didn't share the faith of those who listened to God. 
The writer of Hebrews is telling us this. Again, this is not about heaven. This is not about the afterlife. We, we do that a lot sometimes. Um, like we, that, a lot sometimes. We do that a lot with the Bible. Like We do it a lot when you know, we take these passages that are not uh, talking about heaven. They're like, oh, it's about heaven. This passage is not about heaven. It talks about literally, like, it's, it's the word. It, it says in the passage, it talks about, like, accepting this today, right? Like, this is something we're supposed to do right now. Like, we should have this peace now. And it says, but they didn't have it. They didn't trust God. They didn't believe God. They missed out on this wonderful gift. God has this wonderful gift. So just to, to review what we've talked about, just so we, we, we're on the same page here, God does not get tired, meaning his rest is something other than just you know a, a lack of tiredness, but instead it's an understanding of a value above and beyond anything we create or do. God wants us to share that through a Sabbath, uh, through a time when we ourselves enter that rest, experience that rest, trust God that just as he is valuable apart from his creativity, we are valuable apart from our productivity, and we're supposed to experience that now, but a lot of people miss it, just like the people of the Exodus. We good? We up to date? All right. Now, the com- now becomes the question. This says that we should tremble with fear that some of you, meaning those who are reading it or just had it read to you, that we might miss it. We might miss this piece. We may live our whole lives not embracing the value that God has for us. So the question becomes this. How do we do better than they did? I mean, they've got God miraculously feeding them. They have seen miracle after miracle after miracle. They're following literal Moses, okay? If they can't get it done, how could we? How can we embrace this better than they did? And the answer may sound odd, given what we've talked about so far, but the answer is in the ascension of Christ. The last couple weeks we've been talking about the ascension, this very odd, um, at least to us, this very unknown passage of, of Scripture, this very unknown concept in which Jesus, at the end of his ministry on earth, uh, you know, he, re- he resurrects from the dead, um, and he doesn't just end there, like obviously, um, but that's not where his story ends. Instead, he begins a new ministry. In heaven, Christ goes from a ministry on earth to a ministry in heaven. Uh, as we as we talked about, you know, it, he ascends, uh, he go, he disappears into the heavens, into the clouds, into the whatever. Uh, and and we don't often talk about it a lot because, of course, it kind of freaks us out with a uh, uh, the scientific viewpoint of the way that they understood things. But on a theological level, there's something much bigger than just Jesus. You know, goes up into the sky. This is what we've been talking about with the Ascension. Um, we're just going to keep putting it up there so we're on the same page as we go on. This is what uh, the Ascension is and means theologically, uh, that Christ left this world, and he went to where God rules, and there he is now ruling also. So two weeks ago, we talked about because of that, Jesus is God Last week, we talked about because of that, Jesus is healing, right? So he's healing not just sin, the things that come from within, but he's healing those things that harm us from outside with the powers and the authorities and demons and what we talked about last week, that Jesus is in charge of everything that we can see and everything we cannot see. This morning, as we talk about the ascension, we need to get a little bit personal because there is an aspect of the ascension that the writer of Hebrews was convinced to give us a peace, a rest that God wants us to have, but very often we miss. And to understand why the writer of Hebrews does that, we need to talk about the story of Jesus. So one day, Jesus uh, wanted to breakfast. It was the, the final week of his ministry, the very end of the final week of his ministry on earth. It was, you know, uh, the day after his uh, triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And he and his disciples were on their way to the temple, and Jesus was hungry. And they were walking along, and Jesus, being hungry, sees kind of off in the distance a fig tree. Now, we have to understand, this was not really the season for figs. Like, you're not really supposed to have figs uh, at this point in the year. However, fig trees uh, were not really supposed to have, uh, like, leaves, leaves on them, like the flower part on them, without the fruit, right? So it was sort of an oddity where this tree is not supposed to have anything on it, but it, instead it has these, this, like, leafy, uh, you know, flowery thing on it. And so Jesus sees it off in the distance and says, oh, cool, well, 
you know, I don't know why, but obviously that tree has uh, leaves and, and flowers on it, so it's, it's going to have fruit. So Jesus thinks, I'm going to have a Fig Newton for breakfast, or at least the inside of a Fig Newton. Those things are so good. Really? Ow. Thank you, Jeff. Man, I really like him. Anyway, so he's, he's like, I'm going to have the inside of a Fig Newton uh, before it goes into the cookie. And um, he's, he thinks he's going to have that, that breakfast. And he goes over to the tree. He goes over to the tree. And to his dismay, there are no figs, which makes that tree a liar. Makes it a liar. Jesus doesn't like it. So it's the morning. Jesus is hungry. And clearly, he's a little bit cranky. And so he decides, well, I'm going to make sure that this tree suffers. And he curses the fig tree. And he says, this tree will never bear fruit again. The only, uh, as far as I can tell, as far as I can remember, pretty sure it is, uh, although I always like to hedge my bets in case I've forgotten something, it's the only time Jesus used a miracle to just, like, destroy something. <laughs> He's just like, this tree is terrible. I am done with this tree. And the next day, the disciples come back, and like, there, there's a path between where they were staying and Jerusalem, and they see the tree, and the tree has withered and died. So Jesus curses and destroys this tree. It's among Jesus' strangest miracles. Like, I think if I was ranking the weird miracles, you got, like, the coin fish mouth thing. That's pretty weird. And, and this, like, it's like those are, the, those are your, like, one and two uh, those are your top seeds, basically, for the weird miracle thing. And he curses his fig tree. And I want you to know, it's really important that you do know that, like, there are theological truths that people have, you know, focused on, you know, for this, uh, you know, this story. Like, you know, the fig tree, you know, theologically speaking, prophetically speaking, represents, you know, the, the leadership of Israel and the, you know, and their, the, the, the fig, the fruit not being out, it is they're not producing the fruit because of sin. And so Jesus cursing the fig tree, you know, it's a prophetic statement of, hey, the Jewish leadership, that's not good. You know, and it, it makes sense because the next thing he does is he goes and he cleans out the temple uh, and, you know, makes a whip and all of that. And it's a whole, it's a whole thing. So it, it makes sense. It's really important that we see that, like, that I tell you that there are deeper truths with the fig tree. And we're going to not focus on any of them. Instead, we're going to focus on this. There's a story in the Bible in which Jesus is hungry. And it makes him cranky. And then he doesn't get what he wants because a tree lied to him. So he cursed it and destroyed it and then just moved on with his life. That happened. That happened. Which is to say this, Jesus got angry. Jesus got hungry. And yes, Jesus got hangry. I feel like I've told that joke before, but it's a winner. Jesus woke up on the wrong side of the bed, is what I'm trying to say. You know? Jesus looked at a situation and got so frustrated that he acted out of his anger. Right? Like, that happened. And I've heard a lot of people try to explain this in a way, like, uh, in a way that, like, oh, that's, that's not what's happened. I don't know how you read this story and see anything other than, like, yourself in the mirror. I mean, I don't know about y'all, but I got a temper. Like, I don't know about you guys, but, like, man, I have bad mornings, and, like, there's nothing that can be done to make me happy. And it's no one's fault. It's just, I mean, I just woke up that way. I mean, this is the last week of Jesus' life. He's pretty stressed out, I'd say. You know, like, this dude's about to be arrested by the very people who just celebrated him the day before. He's going to get nailed to a cross and die for the sins of humanity, okay? We could forgive him for being a little bit touchy, you know? Like, I, we got to get the tags on our car replaced. And Stephanie said something about that. She's like, on like Friday, she's like, we got to go do this. And like, I died inside. Died. That mild inconvenience in my life. I'm just like, I, life's not worth living. Like, just, let's just move. You know? Just buy a new... I literally think, like, well, if I buy a new car, do I have to register it? Like, we can just do that. Just trade it in. Jesus is going to die for the sins of humanity, right? Like, this is the most stressful thing any human being's ever done. 
I can understand why, you know, when he's hungry and tired, and everyone's annoying, everyone is annoying, that he, you know, sees his tree. What I'm trying to say is Jesus was a human being, and it's such, it's so hard. I mean, this is historically speaking, we're in a couple of months, we're going to talk about some of this, you know, some of the, the over church history, how we've tried to parse and explain how Jesus is both human and God. And it's been so hard. It's such a hard concept for us to get. So let's just go with it now. Jesus was a guy. He was a person. Like He was just a guy. I mean, not just a guy, but he was also just a guy. You know, he's a, he's a guy. He's a person. He's a human. And it's so important we see that. The, the writer of the book of Hebrews hammers this. Because, you see, that's the answer that, that he gives as to how we can trust God in his rest and how we can trust our value as people. This is what we read later in chapter 4, in Hebrews chapter 4. It says, For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. No creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through to the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. We do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. This is one of the most beautiful passages of Scripture in the entire Bible, and it's also one of the least understood. And the reason is because we live in 2021 and not like most other eras in church history. We have decided that when we hear the word of God, the phrase, the word of God, in our heads, we translate that as Bible. Word of God, Bible. Word of God, Bible. Word of God, Bible. Word of God, Bible. It's just what it is, right? When we read the Bible, what are we reading? The word of God. You want to dig into the Bible? We're digging into the word. That's what we do. Jesus is the word of God. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. He is in the beginning with God. And the Word became flesh and made his home among us. Jesus is the Word of God. And in this passage, you'll notice the pronouns that are used. Not every translation does it. Man, sometimes there's some really bad translations in this passage. This is a good one. Because it tells us that the Word of God that is living and active is a he. It's a he. No creature is hidden from his sight. We are all naked and exposed to the sight of him to whom we give account. So here's what the writer of Hebrews is telling us. The word of God, Jesus, is alive. He's active. And we are laid bare before him, meaning we can hide nothing from Jesus. And that's scary. I mean, full disclosure, which is an ironic thing with the next sentence, I don't think there's anyone in my life I don't hide something from, at least sometimes. I mean, like even Stephanie, like, I mean, for the most part, like, I'd say 95% I'm an open book, but there's things I keep back because it's scary. And maybe that's not healthy. I don't know. Maybe we should see a counselor, but from what I've gathered, if that's unhealthy, we are all unhealthy from what I've gathered with other people's relationships. It's scary to fully expose yourself emotionally and spiritually to, to, to anyone. And this passage says, I mean, it's like this weird poetic thing, uh, piercing the division of soul and spirit, joint and marrow, discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Jesus knows everything. And that sounds scary. But it's really not. Because the word of God to whom we are accountable understands. Jesus can sympathize with us. You see, here's the important thing. God doesn't get tired. Which means that God has no idea what it's like to be tired. No idea. 
And I'm not trying to like, you know, <laughs> I'm not trying to take a shot at God. I'm just like, he's God, right? Like he made the world. He has no clue what it's like to be mortal. He has no idea what it's like to be flawed. He has no idea what it's like to, you know, only got, you know, 10, 12 hours in the end, then you got to go to bed. But Jesus does. Jesus knows what it's like to be tired. Jesus knows what it's like to be so tired and so hungry and so frustrated and so annoyed that he destroys a tree because it doesn't give him the food he wants. Jesus gets that. Jesus understands every issue that we have, every temptation, every struggle, every pain, every victory, every success. Jesus lived a whole life. I love, I love that Jesus' ministry is such a tiny part of his life. We only really know about his ministry. We know, like, he was born. He had that one thing where, like, he ran away in the temple because, like, kids are terrible. And then, you know, it, it, we, we see him as an adult with, you know, adult Jesus doing a ministry, right? That's all we've got of Jesus' life. But Jesus lives for, like, three decades as just a normal guy. And the writer of Hebrews is referring to that. He's saying Jesus lived a life, and he gets it. He knows what it's like to be one of us. And what that has to do with the ascension is basically this. When I pray to heaven, when I pray to God in heaven, to the king of all things, I'm not praying to a God who is divorced from my reality. I'm not praying to a God who can coldly and uh, sterilely look at my reality and say, well, I don't know. I am praying to a God who understands exactly what it's like to be me because he was me. And so what do we get when we turn to God? Mercy, grace, and help. You see, that's how we can trust God. That is how I can recognize that it is not my productivity, it is not my crea creativity, it is not what I do or, or what I can produce. It's none of that. When I pray to God, I'm praying to a God who knows exactly what it's like to be insecure, to not have peace, to struggle. God knows exactly what it's like. And so when we pray, the one we're praying to says, listen, I get it. And so there's mercy, and there's grace, and there's help. People of, of Israel, they, they didn't have that. And the writer of Hebrews tells us that, man, we, we need that. Not when we die and go to heaven, not, not in the future, but right here, right now. And this morning, we're in our third week of our series called The Ascension. Uh, the Christ in Heaven, about the Ascension. Yes, I am distracted by the rain, too. That came out of nowhere, and it's only over there. What is that? Uh, where I am, it doesn't look like there's anything over there. Anyway, anyway, see, everybody's looking around like, what is that? And like, I'm also like, I have a thought, but I'm trying to get out, but I can't see it. Weird. What are we at? We're in the third week of our series called Christ in Heaven. As we're talking about the ascension, as we're talking about what it means, the beautiful, beautiful truth, God wants us to be at peace today, now. God wants us to trust him now. Because God understands, because God was one of us. And God gives us mercy and grace and help. That's what he gives us, not anything else. We're in our third week from our series called Christ in Heaven is this. Peace comes from trusting Jesus, who understands us and gives us the mercy to see our true value and worth. Peace comes from trusting Jesus, who understands us and gives us the mercy to see our true value and worth. So when the musicians are going to come forward, we're going to sing a song. We offer an invitation each and every week for us uh, to take Christ up on this offer of help and mercy and grace to say, I want to do things his way. I want to follow him. I want to be a part of his kingdom. I, I want to understand that I am more than what I do. I am more than what I, I produce. I am more than what I make. You have value and worth. You are worth loving. You are loved, no matter what. 
and we see that in Christ, and Christ understands. You've never made a decision uh, to follow Christ. Uh, we got a nice, warm baptistry. Um, we got all sorts of people who can do a baptism. Uh, I'd love to talk to you at any point. If you're immersed, believe in Christ, believe for a perfect church home. This place is not it. We do serve a perfect God. We want to connect. We want to call. We want to cultivate. We want to meet new people. We want to share the gospel. We want to grow up while we do it. And uh, we want to follow the risen, ascended Christ. As we stand.